Um, all right, so today we're talking about Quarkus and we're going to do it in two pieces. So one is if you've been to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Vox Singapore, this is the same presentation, but it's really an introduction uh, on my side. And the second part is Antonio actually going concrete in Quarkus and writing applications. So that's really the two angles, remembering the why, the what, the how, and then, um, and then going for the uh, you know the concrete aspect with uh, with Antonio and please that's why I ask you to ask the questions on the in the chat so we can you know you can get the most out of that presentation. So Quarkus is open source and it's a stack to write Java applications. And the point uh, is you, you can write your you know your good old style monolith with it uh, that will work. But the project really focuses on three things. Uh, the first one is cloud native and by cloud native. Of course, I meant you know deploying it in the cloud, but also I mean having an orchestration platform that actually uh, handled the deployment and the liveness of your application for you, right? And to really embrace those platforms, you you probably have to adapt to some architectural style, especially the twelve-factor application model. Uh, and if you embrace that one, then you got the develop, deployment flexibility, reactivity, and scalability of those apps. Uh, and Quarkus really tried to help you in that area. The second one is microservice. Uh, you have different app density in a microservice compared to a monolith, of course, uh, but also the communication patterns are different and the scalability models are different. And finally, the serverless aspect uh, is really about startup time. Uh, so it's kind of a microservice that has to start really fast. <laughs> Um, and, and so that's what Quark is, is, is really focusing on. So let me do a super quick demo because Antonio is, is going to do a real concrete one, you know, more live, but um, let's start with that. So you see Quarkus.io here where you can read lots of good stuff around the guides and whatnot, but here we're gonna, just going to start code. So I don't know uh, your actual domain, but let's say Singapore jug and then I'm not gonna write a to-do app, but I pretend I'll start writing a to-do app. <clears throat> and the to-do app is, uh, it's a backend, it's a REST endpoint. Uh, so I use REST easy, JAX-RS in this case. I'll, uh, it's using JSON, so I'll store, store stuff with JSON. I could use validator to validate my data. Uh, I might want to expose stuff in an open API model. Uh, so you see here, I've got a lot of interesting technologies already just, just for the web, right? Uh, Mutiny will have a quick talk about it a bit later. Uh, a lot around REST easy, uh, um, some around, you know, GraphQL, plain servlet if you really want to, web sockets and, and so on, uh, gRPC. Around data, we have the you know the classic Java universe with Hibernate ORM or Hibernate ORM with Panache. Again, I probably won't have time to uh, show you too much of that, but let's say I want to store that in a PostgreSQL database with Hibernate ORM. So you got JDBC driver, you've got uh, cloud you know connectors of sort around data, whether it be Amazon, Google, uh, you know here in this case Elasticsearch, Flyway, Hazelcast, Infinispan, and so on and so on. So lots of um, uh, integration technology, the reactive drivers, I'll mention uh, reactive a bit later as well. Important messaging, like this event-driven approach is super important, whether it be Kafka, MQP, MQTT, JMS, you know, uh, you name it, uh, and, uh, Kafka streams and so on. Um, reactive, uh, you know, if you want a pure reactive model, uh, the way you write applications, uh, we got it covered. You deploy stuff in the cloud, Kubernetes, OpenShift, uh, Lambda, have healthcare fault tolerance. All of that is is growing exponentially in the in the Quarkus ecosystem. Uh, Funky, which is a, a bit of a, a framework, a function framework, uh, Google, a Quarkus function framework that is abstracting yourself from, say, Google or Amazon Lambda and whatnot, and so on and so on. Security, observability, integration. And, um, so I won't go into too more details, but go for it. Uh, go to code.quarkus.io and you'll see all of the integration points that we have. So here I've downloaded a sample app which is there and I'm <clears throat> just unzipping it and copying where I'll actually do the code. And if you see there, I got my to-do app here and the first thing, it's a normal Java app. So the first thing I'll wanna do is probably <clears throat> open my ID 
And the second one is to put Quarkus in dev mode, because one of the cool stuff about Quarkus is that it, it has a dev mode, which is a, a mode where you're supposed to code. So that's, that's kind of useful. Um, we'll see what that means in, in practice. Okay, so you see Quarkus starting in the with the, the uh, what do you call that the debugger, the non-blocking debugger, and uh, it will you know start the app and, and is ready to to go. So here you see uh, the actual code. It's normal app, Java application uh, for people coming from the the Spring side. It's it's uh, equivalent to a controller. So it's just you say hey, I want to answer to hello dash rest easy, and I just want to say hello uh, rest easy. So let me go back here. I do a localhost 8080. I got a landing page that tells me a few things about Quarkus. And if I want to do uh, hello, rest easy, which was testing my aspect here, you, you see it. And I know I'm ready to cut. So it's hello, Singapore, refresh. And I see the results right away. I didn't stop and restart the app. So here it's, uh, let's say, actually. Hello, Singapore Jug. I refresh, and here I got a compilation error. So the minute I do an error, whether it's compilation error or an application error or something that is not showing what I want, I got the results right away, and I see my problem. So here I see, hey, maybe you need to learn a bit of Java to remember that the syntax. I go and refresh, and I see the results. It works with database changes, uh, your whole application. Essentially, you go refresh, and what happens is Quarkus is stopping and restarting itself in, in this case, 0.5 seconds, 0.4 seconds. And it feels like instant to, uh, to the human high or the human feeling, that is. Um, yeah, the other stuff I want to <coughs> show you is the native image compilation, which I'll explain in uh, uh, later in the presentation. But, it's as complex as you know when you when you in 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 Maven at least when you want to package your application you do Maven package but here I want to Maven uh, package it in a native mode so I'll just do that and it takes a oh it will fail because my tests expect this um, that's another thing I wanted to show you the way you test Quarkus you start entirely Quarkus with just the at Quarkus test which will wrap. Uh, the Quarkus bootstrap. And here you just write your test. In this case, we use, uh, well, what's this library again? Uh, rest assured, of course. Yeah, sorry, I was blanking. Um, OK, so that should work better. So the test failed uh, because I didn't have the right uh, name. <clears throat> Let me make sure it's restart, because then the actual compilation takes a bit, bit of time. So. Go and we're getting good, and we're not getting good. What's going on? Oh, you guys should tell me I'm just writing stupid, stupid stuff. Uh, Singapore jug. Okay, should be better now. It's coming up. All right, so we see the app starting. And here, the compilation, this long line is actually the compilation with GraalVM native image. We'll uh, discuss that uh, in, a, in a little while. So let's go back to the presentation now. So why did we do Quarkus? Uh, so what we saw is people moving from monolith to microservices, and sometimes from microservices to actual functions. Uh, to be honest, I, we feel that there is a continuum from a code's point of view. So your, what's inside the box is actually the same code. What's outside is what is different, right? So first of all, the communication model inside the monolith, you're just talking to the same process, you know, so it's easy. If you go for a microservice, you're talking to a different microservice, which might be there or might not be there, right? So you need to adjust that, uh, probably have an event-driven communication model or something like that, right? The scalability is very different as well. Um, it just as a random uh, thought experiment, I'm, what I'm seeing is that a monolith is split into 20 microservices. It might be right, might be wrong, I, I don't know, uh, but that's the uh, possible ratio. 
But the way you scale a monolith is probably by scaling up. The way you scale a microservice is by deploying a new instance of that microservice uh, because it really helps on the orchestration uh, pattern. So the, orchest the orchestration platform will listen to the load and say, hey, it's, it's getting pretty busy. Let me add a new instance to the pool so it scales up. So the, what's interesting is the, not so much the request per second for a given process, but the request per second per megabyte because the way you scale is adding new, new processes, several more processes. Uh, the other important aspect is uh, you're a team of 20 working on a monolith and you're doing a migration to microservices and you're going to be a team of 20 <laughs> doing 20 microservices. So the time you have per microservice to code, improve, wait for the test to run, uh, get the feedback loop that I was mentioning, like changing something, getting the result right away uh, is, is really, really important. Um, uh, that's my personal perspective. Why are we going for microservices if it's so painful, right? Uh, so first of all, I think it's been enabled by the fact that we have those orchestration platforms that are making the complexity of deploying an app and putting it in production and keeping it up in production um, that was hard. So you were just having a big, big uh, bucket to put everything in production. No, it's just... Uh, the cost of one extra lemon is, is pretty small. So you can just deploy many things and it's not going to cost you more necessarily from a complexity point of view. So now that we can deploy many things, we have the option to cut stuff in a smaller pieces. And you want to cut stuff in smaller pieces to be agile so that, for example, if there is a big change to happen in app number three, maybe changing the database from a relational database to a NoSQL database, you can change that without affecting the rest. And it's it costs you a small amount of energy instead of having to rewrite your app entirely. So that's that's the reason. So you got much more technical flexibility as well as, uh, I guess, business flexibility, right? So let's go back to Java. So Java, uh, at the end of the 90s, right, the goal was to make the fastest, uh, more throughput-worthy app uh, system on the planet, right? So. The, the best requests per second as possible on one process on a big machine that was answering like web, you know, web requests. That was the big thing at the time. So they took some optimization approach, which has some drawbacks. You know, there's always pros and cons to a, a given choice. So they decided it's okay to start a bit slow if in the end we can be, we can be really opt optimized down the road. So they interpreted Java as an interpreted language when you start, and then the key part that are really useful are compiled natively, dynamically based on the workload that you're pushing on the JVM, and, and then it's the fastest, right? But the startup time, because it's interpreted, takes a bit of time. You need to load the bytecode, interpret the bytecode, figure out which bytecode to compile, and so on before it's fast. It's the same problem for memory. Uh, because it's interpreted and because you want to do compilation, you will do the compilation in memory, first of all, and you need to keep a lot of metadata information in memory, like, hey, that class is used very often and that loop in that class is actually used extremely often. So let's do the super optimization in there, right? So that metadata takes space. So when you say my app is using 20 megs of heap, Heap is only a small part of your application. There is also the meta space that the JVM is using. It's the, so some, the, some sort of the metadata for the, for the JVM. And the, the size in memory is the resident set size, which is the number for information that Kubernetes will decide if, uh, to, uh, will look at to decide whether you're doing an out of memory usage and will kill you or not, right? So if you're going above your not your requests, uh, but your limits, you know, your memory limit, then that, that's what it's looked at. So RSS is really important. And in a monolith, the heap is probably dominating, but in, in quite a few microservices, the heap is actually relatively small, which means the meta space is, uh, is comparatively pretty big. So now back to our container platform. And remember, we got 50, tw uh, 20 of those elements, and then we scale by deploying a new instance of, the, of those ones, right? Uh, when you compare Java to some other platform, you see that Java having this meta space, you know, size uh, could be at a disadvantage. And that's why some teams are moving away. Another reason some teams are moving away from it, uh, for people that have 
pretty advanced uh, Kubernetes experience and running Java on it. If you had a node crash uh, because the load was pretty high and you need to like, you know, restart a node or rebalance the load of that, you know that Java is pretty slow to start. So, and there is a compounding effect that makes the system pretty unstable unless you over provision your Kubernetes cluster to compensate from that. So Java was not so great in that environment. And that's why we did Quarkus. <clears throat> so what is, what is Quarkus? So it's uh, first of all, focusing on the, on the developer. We want the developer to be as happy as possible, as easy, uh, be able to easily do its work uh, as fast as possible and do something else, right? Maybe, it, maybe it's another task, maybe it's uh, going out, uh, or whatever, having fun. Uh, so we add quite a few things. So first of all is the live reload that I just barely uh, demoed in, uh, in the presentation that is essentially a zero config. You just put Quarkus dev and then every time you do a change and refresh your brother, then the app is restarted really fast and then you see the results right away. It, it changes the way you write applications. Um, it, Quarkus itself doesn't have APIs. It really reuses APIs that you're very familiar with. Some of them are from standards like JPA or CDI or JAXRS. Some of them are non-standard and you know, de facto standard, let's say Camel. Um, configuration is unified. So there is an extension system that actually can talk to one another. So if you define a database connection in your configuration, then that configuration can be reused by Hibernate, Flyway, any you know, uh, system that needs to go and talk to that relational database. So that makes for the configuration um, simplified quite a bit. <clears throat> also, we try to simplify the common usage. Uh, I won't be able to demonstrate that, but Hibernate or I'm with Spanish is about that, simplifying the CRUD operations and really let you focus on the more complex case. And the native image executable generation, if we go back to our compilation here, so in uh, two and a half minutes, what I have is no longer a Java app that I need a JVM to run with, but a Java app that is actually a native executable to, of my platform. So if I go to target uh, to do app snapshot runner, the red one here, it starts and it is started. It started in 0.23, no, sorry, 0 0.023 seconds, right? And it's Java. Let's do it again. This one is a bit slow. This one is fast. And it's the same application. So if I go back there and refresh, um, hold on, Zoom is annoying the hell out of me here. Uh, there you go. Uh, it's the same application. It's, it's still running. Um, so, so that's what Quarkus provides you, like really the choice of going for this native image compilation or the, the normal JVM compilation. All right, benefit number two, uh, the memory usage is much smaller. So on the same JVM uh, for a very simple application, Quarkus will essentially uh, consume half the memory and I'll explain why. And if you go for the native image compilation, it's about 10%, right? It can go up to 10% of it. And it's really important in the density aspect I was talking about. Remember, we scale out by adding new instances and we have 20 microservices. So the density of application within uh, a node of Kubernetes or whatever your cloud provider uh, system is, uh, is going to be super important. It's the same for a more realistic application. It's the same sort of benefits. Uh, so Quarkus is really here at the cloud native age. Um, it's the same for startup time. Actually, this is the time to first respond. So we start, we do a request, get the result, and we stop the clock. And you see the big difference between a, a classic, uh, a classic stack that you might be using today in your uh, in your environment and and Quarkus. And if you go for the native image compilation, it's actually extremely fast. I'll explain that a bit later. Quarkus is reactive at the core, and then we expose an imperative model but we also expose a very similar API in the reactive fashion. So um, uh, we, we also expose a library called Mutiny, which has uh, the notion of uni and multi as types, which is essentially trying to simplify reactive development for the masses, right? Try to make it easier to navigate that API. And back to the API that I was mentioning, so you can use REST easy in a blocking fashion and Hibernate in a blocking fashion with JDBC drivers, but now you can use REST easy reactive, which is the non-blocking version of REST easy with the same annotations and Hibernate reactive with the same annotations, but a reactive API. And you can have a non-blocking all the way down with non-blocking drivers. 
And finally, again, we reuse the frameworks you're very familiar with, you know, high, uh, uh, you know Kafka, Camel, Micro Profile, CDI, et cetera, et cetera, Hibernate, and so on. So how does Quarkus work? So this is how a normal framework would work. At build time, well, at build time, you do your Maven compilation, right, uh, and get the jar. And then at startup time, it will read your uh, configuration file, do some analysis here, read your annotations, like the at auto wired, at entity, you know, at inject, stuff like that. Then build the, its internal meta model. And finally, the framework is ready to answer your request, whether it's a threat, uh, you know, opening a thread, uh, opening a pool, being ready to answer. Quarkus does it differently. We read your configuration, read the metadata annotations, build the internal meta model of the framework, all of that at build time, and then we package that in the jar. And finally, when you start Quarkus, well, you've already have done quite a lot of work, right? So the start is faster. So you got less to do every, every time you start. So you see the startup benefit comes from, some of it comes from here. The other benefit is the, all of the bootstrap classes that were required to be loaded and do all of that analysis that you see in the blue line, they're no longer needed because you've done that job already. So the, the JVM actually saves that load, uh, doesn't have to load that in the meta space. And that's how you get less memory to uh, uh, being consumed by a Quarkus application. So less time to start, less memory used. And then since you know everything at build time, you can remove reflection if it makes sense. It doesn't necessarily always make sense, like makes any big benefit, but sometimes it does. Dynamic proxies and whatnot. So, so Quarkus essentially uh, start other frameworks at build time and then let them use. And then you, can, you have two options. You go for a normal JVM, like Adopt OpenJDK JVM, Oracle JVM, Red Hat JVM, Azul JVM, what you want. Uh, or you go for the native image compilation. <laughs> and the native image compilation is using GraalVM. I know you will have a, a deeper presentation a bit later uh, next year, I suppose. Um, but very briefly, what GraalVM does is taking your, the VM, your JDK classes, your frameworks, your Java classes, and compile everything into an executable, right? Uh, so if you're on Windows, that would be a .exe file. But if it was to compile everything into one executable, imagine the size of the JDK, it would be a big, massive executable file. So what they do is they do what is called a closed world assumption, which means trying to detect the cut path and eliminate, and eliminate everything that is uh, not used uh, by the application uh, the, in a static fashion. So they look, are they using AWT? No, let's remove it. Are they using uh, that part of Hibernate? No, let's remove that code. So the compilation actually end up having being a pretty small native executable. And you no longer need the just-in-time compiler and the metadata information that I was describing before. So you also save in memory. And you save in startup time because everything is already compiled. So there is no interpretation phase. Um, there is some dark side, especially you cannot do arbitrary reflection. I won't go into the detail here. Probably uh, uh, your GraalVM presentation will give you much more information. But that means uh, the classical Java universe and model has to be adapted because if you have to manually list all of the classes where you any of your framework is doing reflection, you're in trouble. And that's what Quarkus is providing, not only faster startup time and memory usage if you use the JVM. But if you go for GraalVM, they, we also pilot essentially GraalVM and provide it the right metadata information. So you don't have to configure some of the, a lot of those annoying GraalVM, you know, low level uh, details. We do that for you. We minimize the dependencies. So it's an opt-in model where you select your dependencies and we try to reduce that scope. And we help the dead code elimination. So we did some change in quite a few frameworks to optimize that. And more importantly, all of the Java ecosystem runs in GraalVM. So it's not a hit or miss, everything works, right? Everything that we covered as an extension works or it's a bug. Um, so when do you use the normal JVM or GraalVM? So first of all, with Quarkus, you will get a higher memory density, probably better requests per second per megabyte than anything out there. Uh, if you're really after the CPU that is really important, then still the JIT will be better than uh, the GraalVM native image. Same for the garbage collectors, okay? So if you have a 
pretty high uh, uh, data intensive application, then the, the, the JVM is probably making sense. And then everything will work and any library that you have will work. If you go for the native uh, compilation, then you got an even higher request per second per megabyte and a very small startup time in the tens of milliseconds, right? So it's really useful for serverless applications or a system that really needs to start really fast or restart really fast. So again, Quarkus is a framework to start other frameworks at build time. So Quarkus itself doesn't really have a lot of APIs. So the APIs you see are the JAXRS API, the Hibernate API, the Spring API, the, or, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Vertex API if you want to and so on. Uh, there is a ton more about Quarkus. I hope you did put quite a few questions in the in the chat and that I'll be able to answer. What I wanted to mention is uh, there is a Spring compatibility layer that looks at the Spring annotations and convert them at build time to the equivalent Quarkus annotations. So it's not really for taking a Spring app and make it run in Quarkus, but it's for taking somebody with Spring knowledge and helping him towards or her towards Quarkus. Uh, without having to not only tran transfer the technology, but also transfer the programming knowledge. In practice, we see people starting with that, but very quickly go for the native you know, Quarkus-driven annotations, uh, whether it be JAXRS or CDI and so on, because they are very similar, so it's really easy to move from one to the other. If, so I'll leave you with those four benefits for Quarkus. We focus on the developer to make him or her really uh, efficient and happy, have a super short feedback loop, helping deployed into the cloud, whether it be Kubernetes, OpenShift, Google Cloud Function, Amazon Lambda, whatever. It's super low in memory usage, super fast in startup time. Uh, the core is reactive, but then we let give you the choice. You can go for the imperative model or the reactive model, and we try to provide a very similar set of um, APIs, uh, so you're very familiar with both models. And finally, we expose libraries and standards you use and love. Uh, so you don't have to, it's a revolution in one aspect. It's just an evolution in another aspect. So we don't try to say it's an entirely new programming language you, or, or programming API you have to learn. And I'll stop there and I'll give uh, back my uh, screen to, um, to Antonio. Well, I think you've been crystal clear because we don't have any questions so oh come on people come on people <laughs> can you see my screen guys uh, there there is, is there is actually one question from uh stefan okay so if you get provided with an open api file how to digest that in quarkus to create routes uh, very good question. I do not exactly know the answer from I know it's possible uh, I think Appcurio has some Quarkus generators. So you can take an op write an open API file with Appicurio and generate it with Quarkus. Um, so Stefan, if you send me an email to ebernard at redhat.com, I'll get to more information. Actually, I'm actually curious about that one. I'm more of a, I'm writing the app and generate the op open API model myself, but you can do it the other way around. So just shoot me an email, I'll, I'll follow up with you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Thank you, Stefan. I think, Antonio, the floor is yours. OK, yeah. so everybody can see my screen all right. Um, yeah. So the idea is um, I'm going to be doing a few copy pastes because I want to be quick. And I want to actually develop three microservices and do some fallbacks, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm starting with an empty uh, project. The only thing I have is I have a Kafka running here. So I have a, a Docker Compose. So if I go Docker container LS, I have Kafka and, and Zookeeper. But that's it. I have nothing. Okay. So um, I'm going to write three microservices. Um, if you have read my books, uh, it's about an API of creating books. Uh, so it's the same kind of topic. So I'm going to create a short um, microservice that creates books. But for creating books, it needs IB ISBN numbers. So that's going to be another, uh, another microservice. And because I'm going to use HTTP, they rely on each other. So when the number falls, uh, I'm going to add some fall, fall back. So it sends a message to a Kafka queue. 
and later the book will be created. So I'm gonna try to be quick, um, but hopefully, you know, not too quick so you can understand. Emmanuel has used um, a web page, you know, code.quarkus.io to generate, to bootstrap an application, but you can also use the Maven plugin. So here I'm using the Quarkus uh, Maven plugin, which does the same thing. Um, I'm using the brand new shiny Quarkus 1.10.3. And here I'm just saying, look, create me a class that I'm gonna call book resource. So that's gonna be the microservice to create books. With this, uh, this path, so it's gonna be on slash API slash books. And I use RESTEZ and, and JSONB because it's gonna produce some JSON. Um, so that's the extensions that Emmanuel showed you, okay? So if I do that, the Maven plugin creates um, a book directory. And um, inside this book, you have exactly the same code that Emmanuel showed. Okay. So because it's uh, several microservices, you know what I'm going to do right now? It's change the port number. Now, this way, it will be listening on port um, 8702. So if I do like Emmanuel did, Quarkus Dev. So on the upper, oh, sorry. On the upper left, I'm gonna leave the, the book microservice running. Okay, so unfortunately, I think there's a bug somewhere later on and, and I'm gonna have to restart it, which is unfortunate. But, um, you know, otherwise I'm not gonna touch much on, the, on that. So if I curl this API, I've got Halo rest easy, like Emmanuel showed you, okay, good. But uh, what I wanna do is not send hello, but it's create a Quarkus book, a Quarkus book. So that's gonna pass, I'm gonna pass a title, okay? Um, and it's gonna return a book. So actually uh, this API will consume text. So I'll, I'll just pass a title of the book. Um, so it's going to consume text, but it will return um, JSON. So here I'm saying JSON. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to have to create a book class. So let's see, create it here. Um, oops, sorry. So the book class is going to have um, a title. Okay, um, a, a topic, um, the ISBN number, the famous ISBN number. And so we can have a bit of instant um, created on. And I'm gonna do instant now. So now we know when the book, has been created. Um, so now what we're gonna do is when we receive the title, we create a new book. Okay, and so book.title is the title that we've just passed. Um, then comes the topic. Well, there's only one topic, so let's go Quarkus. Um, then there's the ISBN. So on, this, that is where, maniacs, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, where I'll invoke the microservice later. And that's it. So I return the book. So now I have to do an HTTP post instead of a get. So that's like that. Uh, so, okay, I'm, I'm just, um, invoking slash API on a post, passing, so the minus D is the data, is the title, so understanding Quarkus. So if I do that, uh, you can see here, uh, no, you can't see anything, so let's do that. Let's do book created. So we see some logs otherwise. So if I do that, up. Oh, 
Oh, what's happening? All right. So if I create a book, oh, what's happening? Method not allowed. What am I doing wrong? So I'm consuming text. Um, I'm producing JSON. Uh, so why do I have a four or five? No, because it's a post. Sorry. Yeah. And because, you know, let's make it nicer. So I generate a two string. Uh, oops, here. I'm generating a two string method. This way, it's much nicer. And, you know, as Emmanuel said, the good thing is I don't have to restart uh, Quarkus again and again. Um, I can do that with a curl command, but I can also go um, and check the Swagger UI. So Swagger UI comes when you add uh, an extension. So um, this famous extension, I've started with just REST easy. So now I'm, I'm using you know, again, the Maven plugin, and I'm saying, please add an extension called, you know, o, you know, Open API, and I just do that. You're going to see. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not in the right place. So, what it, what does it mean? You know, it has restarted. N not much. You know, I could have done it by hand, but uh, on the POM XML now I have um, uh, Open API. Um, Quarkus, I say, understanding. And by the way, Quarkus. so we're in dev mode, so that's why the Swagger UI is enabled by default. But in production, by default, Swagger UI would be disabled, though you can force that with a Quarkus dot something property. And let's also fix the test because it's going to be useful. So now if I do um, a Maven test, it's going to crash because it's, you know, it expects rest easy and I don't have a get anymore. So um, here I said, should, should create a book. And so this time it's, um, so I have to give it a body. The body is the title of the book, title of the book. Um, so when, this time is when I do um, a post, okay, uh, then it's a 200, you know, it's fine. It should have been a 201, but it's fine. And I'm going to make sure the body is correct. So the body is, I make sure the, um, the title is title of the book. The topic, remember that we've set it. Uh, you know, it, it, it's Quarkus and it has an ISBN and created that. So here I'm, I'm using rest assured to check the JSON result. So hopefully I, I haven't made any typo and the test pass. No, God jam, uh, created on, okay, sorry, created on. And I'm testing it because then uh, you're going to see that it's going to be quite uh, useful. Okay, good. Now let's do what we are supposed to do now, which is uh, invoke another microservice. So for that, I'm going to use again the same plugin, the same uh, Maven plugin, and create a second uh, microservice. This time it's going to be called number. Here it is. Same code. So if you look at, um, you know, it's a REST endpoint, it returns uh, hello REST easy. Um, so here, this method is going to generate an ISBN number. Um, yeah, it will return a string. And so a number and an ISBN is 13 number digits. So let's put it 13 and let's go new random next 
int and you know something like like that. So we just you know a random number and we're gonna do um, oops number no ISBN and we're gonna return this number. Again, I'm going to leave it, leave Quarkus uh, in dev mode. Later we will kill it, but for now it's fine. And um, so if I curl this, oh yes, you know what I haven't done? That's why I need to shut down Quarkus because I'm going to change the listening port. So let's do it. So number will listen on 8701, book 8702. So now I'll start Quarkus in the right port number. And if I curl it, I should get a number. Okay. Well, now you know what's going to happen. I'm going to link both um, uh, microservices. And for that, there is um, a really nice uh, extension coming from the micro profile, uh, which is um, REST client. So if I do my post again, uh, you see that I create a book with no ISBN. So let's fix that. So first of all, I need to add a new extension. It's called REST client. It comes from the micro profile. So again, it's just a matter of adding an extension. Quarkus restarts, easy peasy. And now I'm gonna actually cheat. So I'm gonna take the number resource. I'm gonna do a copy paste on book here. I'm gonna call it number proxy. So, you know, naming things is hard. So le let's leave it simple. So the, the REST client, the micro profile REST client um, says, well, just create an interface with the same signature. So I'll leave everything but the body. I can even take that out. And the only thing I need to do is register that as a REST client. That's all, okay? So now the book resource, what I have to do is actually inject my number proxy. Let's call it proxy. And here I go proxy generate number. Do you think it will work? Yes, no. No. Why? Because there's only one piece of information missing. Here, I need to say that um, uh, I just want to copy paste so it's not too long. Here, I just need to say, you know, the remote uh, microservice is on the other side of the planet. So I need to give a URL. As you can imagine, here it's a local host and it's set into concrete, but uh, in real life. You know, of course, it's uh, it's going to be an alias, um, and that's it. So it's working. Um, it's working, and uh, my test is passing. Why? Well, because uh, you know, each time I run my tests, there's actually uh, an invocation on the microservices. That means that if I kill the number microservice and run my tests, it will not work. So what about mocking? And um, I have to say, uh, Quarkus makes life really easy. So let's mock the number proxy makes uh, life easy because it's just a matter of, of course, implementing the proxy. Therefore, you have to 
implement the generate ISBN. So you don't want to invoke the remote service. So you just go mock ISBN. And the nice thing that Quarkus bring is this mock, uh, you know, annotation. So it comes from the package IO Quarkus test mock. And you just need to add, you know, again, the rest client thing. So now if I run my test, they should succeed. Great. Okay. So now, so let me recap. When I do a post uh, with the um, number mi uh, microservice uh, running, it works. It's fine. You know, everything is uh, happy. Sorry. You know, so that's fine. But now, of course, there's this dependence now on these both um, microservices, meaning if I kill the number, it doesn't work. What we want to do is we say, well, we would like to store that somewhere, send it to a, you know, a Kafka queue or somewhere else, and later on, it will be uh, created. And again, that's super easy. With the micro profile again, there's this extension called full tolerance. So I'm adding full to tolerance to, um, to the book. And here, so on the create book, see the problem is we invoke the microservice and the microservice is down. So we need to fall back on something different. Well, what we can do is, you know, again, copy paste, um, this um, this method and say, well, this is actually falling back on creating a Quarkus book. The problem is here. So um, sorry, no ISBN, microservice is down, we'll create later. And here I go, uh, fall back will book will be created. So now we're going to use this fallback annotation coming from um, uh, coming from full tolerance. Oh, uh, I think mm, let me refresh fallback. I think it's my ID not oh syncing. Yes, it was just my ID. So here I said fall, fall back on um, a method called fall back on created. So the only thing is fall back. If, if there's a, an invocation failure, it will fall back on a method that has exactly the same signature. So it has to take a string and return a book. Okay. So now, if I curl again, uh, I think that's when I need to restart Quarkus and I don't know why. Um, I think it because there was an exception and I don't know, but I have to. So uh, you see it's falling back. If I start the microservice, the number microservice, as you can guess, it will uh, create a book with an ISBN number. But if the ISBN number microservice is down, then it will fall back to something different. Well, like we still have a few minutes, so let's fall back on a Kafka topic. You know, it's Kafka, it's fashionable. So let's do that. Um, so Quarkus comes with another you know, extension, the re, uh, reactive messaging Kafka. So I'm adding this extension to book because what I'm going to do is uh, inject, inject a channel. So the channel comes from, oops, um, the channel comes from this extension. I don't know why my ID doesn't refresh. Yes, import class. And here I, I give the name of a channel. So let's say 
failed books. So the name of this channel is quite important. Um, what do I inject? Well, I inject an emitter. Uh, and I'm going to emit, let's say, for now a string. So the string uh, representation of the book. OK, so now that I have this emitter, when I fall back, what I do is I send the book to string. It could have been an object, a JSON uh, representation. I just wanted to make easy. And now, sorry again for the copy paste, but it's a bit long. What I do here is I said, well, the, the full books, failed books, the connector is Kafka because it could have been MQTT, MQTT, IMPQ or whatever. And she realized that into a string because I could have put JSON, I could have put binary. Uh, okay, so what's imp really important here is this fail book. It has to be the name of, uh, of the channel. So if I fell back, I'm gonna send the book to a Kafka channel. Well, guess what? We're gonna create a third microservice that's gonna just listen. So here, um, this time I will use different extensions. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, I'm gonna, well, let me show you on the POMXML, it will be easier. So this book fallback, uh, the book fallback uh, uses the messaging Kafka only. Okay, it's not a REST API or whatever. So actually, because it's not a REST API, uh, I'm going to go here and, and delete everything. Um, this method, uh, let's call it... Way, we're working on a generator that would actually generate uh, uh, extension aware piece of code instead of uh, just having the rest endpoint. So it's coming real soon. So here I will receive a book in a string uh, representation. Uh, it returns nothing, but you, know, you can imagine that this method could have been slightly clever. Um, and I'm gonna do a book to be created later. And now, that's really nice. Uh, we have this annotation coming from uh, the uh, micro profile me uh, messaging, and we just give the name of the channel. That's it. Well, that's not completely it because uh, as you can imagine, there's on this side of the microservice, there's also a bit of configuration. So we go, um, the fail book this time is incoming, they are the, uh, microservice is outcoming the fail book so it's the same name of the channel and i'm saying listen to kafka and please deserialize uh, with the string deserializer and my kafka is up and running so if i um, if i start oops Quarkus in dev mode on the um, on this microservice, and I try to create a book. Oh yeah, that's not falling back. I think that's again. I need to restart when I do that, uh, so it connects to Kafka. Uh, I've been having so end check fell. Oh why? Uh, I I do have my Kafka running, don't I? Yes. Um, so what happens if I curl that? So yeah, it's it's sending, but it's not receiving. So I might have done uh, something wrong, which is unfortunate. Um, so here I have failed books. Oh, typo, damn. And I think I have to restart it. Yeah. So it's filled books with an S. Ah, damn. Yep. You should oh. open an issue. Uh, yeah. You can take each, that at real time, actually. Yeah. Each time I, I use Kafka and I do that, 
like here, it won't take, um, see, book created later. So I have to kill it and restart it. And it's always when I use this uh, messaging thing that I have that. So, yes. So, so, yeah, so please open the issue with yeah, context. Good. And, uh, make sure so as you have imagined, if I now have the three um, microservices running, so if I can get an ISBN number, it's fine. You know, I can create a book with an ISBN. But if the microservice is down, then it falls back, it sends it to a Kafka stream and uh, topic and, and the job will be done later. Um, actually, I still have a few minutes. So I've created this loop, which is exactly what I'm doing. It's a curl, okay? It's, it's a curl and it loops. So it creates a book, you know, every second. So let's leave it here. Um, what I wanted to show is, um, let's take the number. Yeah, if it's gonna be easier. So if I do a clean package, uh, let's keep the tests. So we were running in dev mode. As Emmanuel said, um, if you package it, you have like, you know, good old spring, you have um, a jar, an executable jar. So you can go Java jar. Uh, it starts very, very quickly, as you've seen. Um, but also I can do the, um, the native uh, compilation. So, you know, Emmanuel uses the um, dash uh, p native, uh, which is the same thing. So, well, it's gonna be, oh, uh, oh yeah, the test. So, um, Maven test skip. You know, it's True. supposed to be a reason it's like, don't waste the three minutes for compilation in, if the test don't pass, but for demo, <laughs> 20 minutes. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it, is, it is a bit annoying. So it's going to take a bit of time, um, a few seconds, because I have a huge machine, but it is indeed a bit slow. Um, but what's going to happen now is thanks to Graal VM, uh, we're going to have an executable. So a very, very tiny, um, of course, the microservice, there's not a lot of code, you know, inside. But as Emmanuel said, the compilation, the native uh, compilation takes also your bits and pieces of the JVM or the Substrat VM. Uh, so in this bi binary, you have everything. Uh, you don't need an external JVM. Um, so, and then, yeah, I'm going to do that then. By the way, I can't stress enough what I said. It's like, uh, I've had conversation with so many uh, of our clients, which had issues where, uh, you know, their Kubernetes cluster, so open shift in our case, where, uh, really bring down to their knees because of the slow startup and initial high CP usage of a, a Java app starting. Um, so, you know, this is exactly why Quarkus is starting fast and so on. It's helping in, in those situations and avoid uh, people having to overcome it there. Well, not overcome it, but uh, set a cluster that is twice as strong as it should be really just for the startup. Right, so we're, we're really wanting to address that problem. So here, if you look at the binary, it's 28 megs. And in this 28 megs, we have the JVM bits, you know, the only bits that we need. So you don't have to go Java dash char. And, uh, you know, it starts really quickly. And that was, you know, what Emmanuel was saying is it responds uh, quite quick, quickly. There is another trick I want to do is, I'm going to build a native, but um, for a native container. So that's another, you know, minus D Quarkus uh, property or Bama the test. Um, why? Um, because now I've built a binary for Mac OS. Uh, but if I want to deploy it on a Docker image, um, I want a binary that was built for Linux and on my Mac, 
you know, I can't, or if you are on Windows. So it's quite clever the way, um, uh, you know, Quarkus does it. It's, um, it goes and uh, you need Docker. It takes a Docker image with a Linux um, box in it, and it just compiles using it. So now I'm compiling for Linux without having a Linux. Um, so again, and it's you know, Docker, unfortunately... Docker or Podman, for info, like uh, some people use uh, Podman for that as well. And so unfortunately, it's um, still a bit, you know, uh, long. But and then yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so now I'm going to have a binary that doesn't run on my, on my machine because it was compiled for for Linux. So we went from 25 years of uh, you know uh, uh, develop anywhere and you know run everywhere. Compile once, run everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> that's I know that's it's compile it. <laughs> compile to one <laughs> compile to one. It's a new model, right? So it said is marked as an executable, but could not run by your operating system. Good. Um, you know what? Quarkus comes with another you know, extension, the Docker, or you can also use Jib. So I'm adding this extension. And now what I can do actually is um, now that I have a, bi a binary created for Linux, I can package it. Um, in a container image. So when I use this minus D Quarkus container image build true, what it's going to do, it's, um, you know, when the project is created, there's actually a few Docker files. Um, oh, what? It was the, the test again. Oh, damn. Let's keep quotes true. Um, yeah, and now it's creating, yeah, you know, everything was there. So if I do Docker image LS, the image is here. And now it's just a matter of, uh, you know, running. Um, and here we go. So when you create a Quarkus app, it also comes with a few Docker files to make it easy. And there's even later, you can add a Kubernetes extension for Minikube. And I could have done that with uh, Minikube. So here it is for me, you know, I've developed uh, three microservices with Kafka, with, you know, Docker and everything uh, quite, you know, easily and without starting too many times uh, Quarkus. That's it for me, people. Cool. Um, so if people have one, you know, last set of questions, uh, just go for it. Um, I tried to answer quite a few in the chat. So thanks for asking. Uh, it's uh, always good. Plus, I didn't know the answer, but luckily I could connect to <laughs> some of my colleagues and, and get you the, the, proper, uh, the proper answer. Stop sharing. That's what I wanted to do. Sorry. Um, so uh, somebody was asking, for example, uh, what are the spring uh the spring to quarkus annotation conversion so you can go to quarkus.io slash guides let me share the screen real quick uh quarkus.io slash guides uh, so quarkus.io slash guides and then here there is a conversion is it not oh, look for it oh, hold on language compatibility sorry uh, and here you got the spring di compatibility spring web compatibility and so on so in, in practice if you go to spring di or spring web you will see the list of annotation and then there is a table that says left left is the uh, spring one right is the uh, the either jacks or s1 or you know something equivalent uh, so you can go there uh, spring data is a bit different spring data does expose api so it's literally the spring data apis uh that we were having you know also at runtime the engine is different but the api is is the same so there is no conversion so to speak it's just the engine is uh, executing what you're asking 
so yeah, go go for those lists. And if you see uh, not a UI bug, but if you if you see um, a set of extensions that you feel you you wish you had uh, from the Spring side uh, that are not there, then just have a conversation. Open a, a GitHub on uh, so you go to actually again Quarkus. Oops. Quarkus.io is a community here. And then first of all, we have our roadmap, uh, but here you can go on GitHub, uh, sorry, the GitHub issue tracker and open an issue. Uh, you can flag it, but otherwise we got a bot that sort of auto flag stuff. And, uh, you know, of second level is you provide a pull request or something, but in worst case it's listed and the community can react to you know, plus ones and the, the, the priority of things and, uh, and figure stuff out. We've been extremely reactive. We do one release every month approximately uh, since two years or something. So not too bad. So I'm adding the, um... I'm adding the GitHub link with the with the demo that you've seen, and there's also a huge README. You know, I've been doing copy paste from the README file. So, if you go to this link, you have all the code of the microservices done, um, how to use them, how to start to test them. But more important for me and now for you is um, the README tells you how to go from scratch to what we've seen. So it's exactly what I've done, I've detailed all the readme, do this and do this and do that. Um, so you can go there, get all the code or start from scratch. The only thing that I had uh, was the infrastructure with, uh, with the Kafka and, and, um, and the bootstraps. So the Maven plugin uh, command that will bootstrap the three microservices. So, uh, you know, to grab the code yeah. and, and, you know, run it even at work with your colleagues. Uh, you can do that at work or, you know, at home with your, with your family if, if you want to board them. So there are two questions. So Timothy is, is asking, would there be a, a continuous integration, would the test continuous integration be extended to the native ARM64, given that Apple and Graviton are two? I think Graviton 2 is the... Amazon testing of the Apple hardware coming or something. Maybe I, I misunderstand, but uh, um, so the CI we're using is actually GitHub uh, Actions. Uh, so when GitHub comes with uh, Apple M1 hardware, we'll, we'll be able to have that. Uh, that being said, um, uh, Red Hat has been uh, contributing to the GraalVM ARM64 support. Uh, we've really accelerated uh, and pushed Oracle um, that way. And um, so it's it's there, it's available. And of course, it's been there yeah. in the JVM, which uh, again has been a, a Red Hat contribution. So the ARM, the ARM support for the JVM and, the, and GraalVM is there. Uh, we, I don't think we have CI tests uh, specifically for those, if I recall. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll just wait for GitHub to you know, grant our wishes in the, on this one. And the second one is, is there Stomp and SOC.js support in Quarkus? Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, do you mind asking that to the Quarkus dev mailing list? So it's a Google group or opening a, a, a Quarkus issue in, uh, in what I showed, like a Quarkus IO slash Quarkus on, on GitHub. Um, appreciate it. Plus, it's about not my pay grade, but it's <laughs> about my knowledge. So, uh, I don't want to say something stupid here. Okay. And correct okay. me if I'm yeah. wrong, uh, Emmanuel. But yes, I think. You're wrong. Okay, I knew that. Bam. No, I think there's um there's support for um, for Raspberry, isn't it? Well, yes, through the ARM support, yes. Um, yeah. So some people have been have been playing with that. Yeah. Uh, okay, I guess let's call it uh, a day. And of course, people can come to, as I said, Quarkus Dev and ask us uh, more questions. Uh, I think uh, Antonio, you're lurking around uh, anyway in these these spaces. Uh, so you know, feel free to reach uh, to any any one of us. Thank you a lot, uh, Emmanuel and Antonio, for this great live coding and lecture.
uh, give a big round of uh, virtual clap or you can clap if you turn on your mic to, to everyone. And thank you. It has been the meetup with the most question asked <laughs> for a long, long time. <laughs> okay, cool. So it's possible, people. <laughs> no, that's really good. We need to find new ways to interact uh, since we cannot be physical, physically together. <laughs> physical together is a different thing, but physically together, uh, you one is upside down. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's just ex force yourself to express it in this, you know, uh, digital native way, I guess. And uh, sorry, I was busy coding, but I just uh, renamed um, my Zoom. So as you can see, Emmanuel is Paris, and I'm Paris Central. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you. And thank you, guys. Finish yes. with yes, a cool. Google Penguin from Antonio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye, everybody. The recording will be available uh, soon.